This is the season of gloom and doom. The war in Ukraine is showing no signs of ending. Petrol, diesel and gas prices are showing no signs of falling. Ditto for inflation. Interest rates are showing signs of heading in only one direction and that is up. GDP growth rates are showing signs of heading in the opposite direction. So also the rupee. And stock markets are all over the place, although after having fallen steeply in recent months. The Nifty has fallen nearly 20% after hitting its all-time high of 18,604 points last year. The BSE Sensex is trading near 13-month low levels. Just last week, the indices fell 5.5%, their worst week since May 2020, and that was then, the first wave of COVID. But in this season of gloom and doom comes a very refreshing argument of what lies ahead for Indian investors and how it is not all that pessimistic. In fact, it is so optimistic that it will force all of us to sit up and take serious notice. Hello and welcome to Quartermaster, our quarterly show on change, the direction of economy and business and how investors can benefit from it. Investment guru Saurabh Mukherjee of Marcellus Investment Managers is back with us for another masterclass and I promise you, you will love this one as much as you have liked our previous conversations, if not more. Hello Saurabh, so happy to have you back at the print. Thanks Vipi, thanks for inviting me back. Oh yes, I mean, I'm sure you have seen all the comments and how uh, all our viewers have uh, loved our conversations and want you to do this more often, not just once in a quarter. So I throw that at you at the beginning of this, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, But before we get down to our uh, discussion today on the latest uh, uh, insight uh, you are going to give us on the direction of the Indian uh, economy, business and the stock market for investors, a quick question for you on the present, uh, Saurabh. What do you make of this steep fall, this volatility? How are you navigating it? So this has happened many times before IP, nothing unusual here. Uh, the global economy is growing at its fastest pace, I think, in something like 20 years. The Indian economy, the Indian labor market is in its uh, strongest shape. This is the formal labor market and the overall economy is in its strongest shape, I think, in 15, 16 years. And naturally, the world over, you have demand outstripping supply. If you have demand outstripping supply, naturally, you get inflation. And when you get inflation, the job of central banks is to hike interest rates to, to dampen it. Nothing unusual in this about at all. So there's nothing about unusual about this whole sequence of events. Excess demand, high inflation, rising interest rates. And um, and stock markets actually come, come through these sorts of uh, interest rate height cycles pretty well. If, you, if a central bank is hiking rates because of demand side pressures, uh, which I think are pretty uh, obvious to everybody, anybody who's tried to book a holiday in India, anybody who's tried to hire people for their factory knows how bad the how bad the conditions are. You've got a wild excess demand and naturally you end up with high inflation. Central banks hike rates central and stock markets usually come through these rate hike cycles pretty well. We saw this, for example, in 2004. In 2004 and 2005, the US Fed hiked, I think, 10 times in two years. And uh, what happened after that was the greatest bull run in uh, in American history uh, uh, post the post the Second World War. So no, I'm not particularly perturbed by it. I just get a little amused when people create all sorts of doomsday scenarios mm-hmm. out of our fairly uh, 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 predictable economic cycles. In one of our uh, last conversations, uh, Saurabh, uh, you talked about how a recession in America is probably good for uh, India and your uh, you know, wish seems to be coming true. I'm not so sure the US will go into recession that easily. YP. I think the American economy is actually in its strongest shape for many, many years. Uh, I was there on work a couple of weeks back. And I have never seen a labor market like this anywhere in the world. You cannot find workers for anything. You try to you land in a small airport, you try to get a, a taxi, you won't find any because all the taxi drivers have gone to become truck drivers because you get $200,000 a year in America for driving a truck now. right? You go to a three-star, four-star hotel, uh, you would have paid for your breakfast with your room rent, with your room charge. But there's nobody to serve you breakfast because there are no chefs available. Right? It's an insanely tight labor market. And I don't think the American economy will go into recession as easily as some of the uh, economists are, are forecasting. That. And I think those forecasts are fairly glib and it's quite disappointing to see that coming from professional economists. 
Oh, wow, that's that's very uh, refreshing to hear, Saurabh. So let's get to the central uh, you know, theme of our uh, conversation today. And uh, that is uh, your argument uh, looking at what happened in Japan in the 1970s and what happened in the US in the 1970s. And you say what happened in Japan in the 1970s is a better guide for India and Indian stock markets. So can you first tell us where the US uh, was in the 1970s, considering you know, the fashionable view is that Indian markets will uh, you know, crater with the American markets uh, with all this Fed uh, rate tightening and hiking and all of that. So where was the US uh, in the 1970s? So why don't I just sort of focus on the specific point as to why do people believe, why do people in India believe that what happens in America mm -hmm. will, will, be, will be a, 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 a leading indicator of what will happen in India. And the main reason for that is 60% of the world's currency is the US, US dollar. If you look at global money circulation, 60% of it, of it is American dollars. And as a result, uh, uh, when the American central bank hikes interest rates, it basically pushes up the cost of money globally. Right. And the American Central Bank has pretty much fulfilled this role from the early 70s onwards. 71 was I think 71 America came off the gold standard until America and the rest of the world was on the gold standard. The amount of gold dictated how much currency would be in circulation. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon took America out of the gold standard in 71. And since then, the Federal Reserve has, has had the freedom to print as much currency as it wants. And therefore, because the dollar is the world's dominant currency, the majority of currency floating around globally is the dollar, the Federal Reserve ends up uh, moving interest rates in all the countries because they control the world's largest currency, right? And, and the, the fashionable view therefore becomes, since the Fed controls global interest rates because it controls the world's dominant currency, by hiking interest rates, the Fed will uh, uh, push the Indian economy into a slowdown, if not a recession. It's unlikely we'll go into recession, but the viewers India will go into a slowdown. And hence, you know, the fashionable view goes on. Let's sell our stocks today because, you know, it's pretty clear the Fed will have to hike, right? That's the that's the kind of the, the, the line of thought driven by uh, the dollar's dominance and driven by the fact that in from the early 70s, uh, uh, America and hence the rest of the world has exited the gold standard and the, the, the world's main central bank controls the world's interest rates and therefore they will push us into a slowdown, right? And and, and that view right, doesn't actually work. And, and, I, and, and, and the reason it doesn't work is there's a whole bunch of economic facts that, that view uh, uh, that have to be taken into account before these glib prognostications that the Fed will hike and we will go into recession. Mm -hmm. right? Before these uh, glib prognostications can actually be 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 uh, uh, be uh, accepted at face value. So uh, we will not accept these uh, glib uh, prognostications at face value. Uh, but let's go back in time, uh, sort of 1970s. Why, why was uh, the U.S. in a very troubled uh, phase at that point of time? Uh, I mean, we know about the oil shock. Would you want to you know, explain that? Uh, and especially the point you make that uh, the U.S. Uh, markets did not give zero returns for a very, very long time uh, uh, at that yeah. point of time. Yeah. So, so the, the parallels to the current uh, set of circumstances in America, that there are fair few for America, for America today and America 50 years ago, there are parallels. So specifically, America through the late 60s, as everybody knows, had the civil rights movement to contend with, and they had the anti-Vietnam anti -Vietnam war protest to contend with. And late 60s, early 70s was a, was a time of enormous social churn in America, right? Uh, the, the baby boomers sort of came, went to university, the baby boomers, kids who were born uh, just after the Second World War, they end up going to college through the late 60s, early 70s. They started doing all sorts of pradarshan and demonstrations and so on, social churn. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, was the American president. As I said, he took America out of the gold standard. Momentous decision, right? Till 71, the amount of 
American currency was determined by how much gold America had, and therefore the Federal Reserve couldn't mess about with it. Mm-hmm. Nixon said, "This is just too tight. Yeah, this is just very tight for me. This means monetary policy is tight. Interest rates are high. Uh, and how am I going to win? How am I going to win elections? Let's take America off the gold standard, chaco currency, get the economy revved up, and you know, uh, and ensure you know victories for me in the polls, right?" And then, as you and I know, he did something called Watergate, that little incident where he tried to snoop into his opponent's office and do all sorts of naughty things. And therefore, early political turmoil in America a plenty, right? On top of that, and again, not unsurprisingly, this is this geopolitical link here with America and turmoil. You go into the Arab-Israeli War of nineteen seventy-three, the Yom Kippur War. I think October or November nineteen seventy-three, Israel basically Israel invades uh, Egypt, and 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 they fight, and oil prices go up three to four x. Not not the two x that we are seeing currently, three to four x. As soon as oil prices run up three to four x, that's the first oil shock in human history. Uh, America goes into recession. CPI inflation goes through ten percent, and then. America stumbles along, uh, as everybody knows. Nixon loses uh, uh, loses his uh, presidency, gets impeached. Uh, uh, the Rep- Republicans lose lose the presidency to Jimmy Carter, and then come 1979 comes the next oil shock, the Shah of Iran. The world, at that point, Iran was the world's largest oil producer. The Shah of Iran gets deposed, and the oil price goes up another two to three x. Right over the course of the 70s, in total, the oil price goes up. Tenfold. It sounds unbelievable today, but it goes up tenfold because American interest rates go so high through the 70s. From 71 to 81 YP, the U.S. 10-year bond yield rises non-stop. Okay. Right. With American inflation consistently breaching double digits, American 10-year bond yields rising for 10 years. Unsurprisingly, the American market gives a return of zero percent. The Dow Jones gives a return of zero percent. Through the 70s, it didn't matter who you were. You were McDonald's, you were Walmart, you were Xerox. It was impossible to compound share prices. Right? That's America for you through the 70s. And the reason I'm saying I'm I'm, I'm creating some parallels is is uh, you know the political turmoil in America today is reminiscent of uh, what happened then. And in a way, the Arab-Israeli war, the Shah of Iran, right? The parallels with Ukraine, Russia seem seem fairly seem fairly obvious. And Japan at that time uh, was not in the same league as America, or not in the same league that it went on to create for itself. And that was the decade in which uh, you know Japan transformed itself. Uh, and the the argument you've made in your uh, study is that uh, oil prices were higher in Japan than they were in the US at the beginning. Uh, and because twice, twice as high, twice as high actually. Yeah. And Japan uh, uh, ex- imports uh, all its oil, almost all its oil, which is so much like uh, how it is for us here in India. So, Absolutely. what happened to Japan in the nineteen seventies? Right. So, so I think it's worth sort of stepping back a little bit and understanding Japan, as everybody knows. The Second World War and America, in specific, you know, turned Japan into a into a hellhole by the end of it, right? Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the and the rest of it. It took Japan till around 1954, 1955, just to have a reasonably solid economy, right? So the Japanese economic miracle doesn't actually start till 1955. And if you watch Japanese movies of the 50s and 60s, I'm a big Japanese movie lover, so Akira Kurosawa. The lovely movie is called High and Low. So actually, it's a thriller movie, right? Akira Kur- Akira Kurosawa's High and Low. I think it's a sixty-three movie. You can watch plenty of Japanese movies through the fifties and sixties. The reason I'm recommending Akira Kurosawa's High and Low is it's a very it's an exciting thriller, and it shows you Japanese underworld. It shows you slums. It shows you unemployment. It shows you drug abuse. It shows you kidnapping, extortion, full Bombay ka underworld wala story type, right? And if you watch Japanese movies through the fifties and sixties. You'll realize Japan in the 60s wasn't very different uh, socially, uh, economically, to what India is today, right? Uh, the reason I'm saying this is a lot of people tend to have this glamorous vision because they know the contemporary Japan. They believe 50 years ago, 50 years ago as well, the Japanese were a hyper-efficient, clinical nation, right? Every nation goes through the phase we are going through, right? <laughs> When the growth takeoff happens. It doesn't say, uh, you know, in 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 stencil letters. This country is now looking good for takeoff. It will happen. It doesn't say that in stencil letters. It's for investors like us to figure out that the conditions are right. Now, 
through the 60s japan grew at 9 10% the world in general boomed through the 60s right uh, it was called the swinging 60s for a reason the global economy boomed japan grew at 9 10% but japan boomed in shipping metals and mining or in mine, metals mining to india metals and shipping heavy industries was japan's forte through the 60s right and japan did an extraordinary job through the through the 60s then comes the oil shock right then comes 1973 right going into the oil shock as you mentioned yp oil already cost twice as much in japan as it did in america and the reason for that is not very difficult to fathom uh, america has some has a fair bit of domestic oil actually japan had none it was entirely imported and oil in japan cost twice as much in america right in spite of this japan dealt with the oil shock so brilliantly that inflation did not go into double digits through the 70s barring the first couple of years of the oil shock the 10 year government bond yield didn't rise barring those first two years of the oil shock uh, 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 the stock market trebled american stock market gave zero the japanese stock market trebled through the 70s and the main reason that this that this miracle happened this is the japanese economic miracle world oil prices going up 10x in 10 years japanese stock market trebling in those 10 years right and the reason it happened the main reason uh, i happy to elaborate uh, in a bit the main reason was japan pivoted its economy away from heavy industries like ship building like metals into light light industries the electronics that we know japan uh, 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 that japan is famous for was born in the 70s the small cars that we all drive around india were born in the 70s japan's economic uh, metamorphosis its transformation took place in the same decade where the us stock market gave zero returns and that's why i keep telling people don't draw draw glib prognostications from the federal reserve there's economic fundamentals that one needs to keep in mind when we draw these inferences from us monetary policy sort of you've done uh, some case studies and you have talked about two companies in those case uh, studies uh, i i'll name them but obviously you will elaborate on that one is of course toyota uh, so many of those cars we see driving around us uh, today and the other one is casio i mean we know casio for a lot of things uh, but for those of us who grew up with calculators casio was the calculator to have uh i mean some of our kids now of course use casio uh, music uh, synthesizers but but casio started somewhere else do you want to talk about those two case studies okay. sure so so I'll, i'll 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 go into the case studies yp suggested let me also explain the rationale for using these case studies remember i was saying through the 1960s Japan was a heavy industrial economy shipping metals steel it was one of the i think by 1970 it was the world's second largest steel producer right now now obviously all of these heavy industrials are very oil and gas consumptive japan's pivot away from heavy industrials to companies like toyota honda nissan casio sony panasonic you can see immediately all of these industries are more knowledge intensive they are r&d research and development intensive they are less energy intensive so successful was japan's pivot so successful was japan's pivot that from the oil shock of 73 through to 1985 japan's use of crude barely grew at all right economy growing at 5 6% crude demand in japan flatlined from the oil shock onwards right incredible achievement just to give you another sense of japanese uh, uh, pivot away from oil and gas in 1975 67% of japan's electricity generation came from oil mm-hmm. by 1985 the figure was 27% right they comprehensively pulled back their demand their reliance on crude for generating electricity right um and and one more sort of factoid in the pivot between 1970 and 85 japanese steel production barely grew they throttled off on steel that between 1970 and 85 japanese production of electrical products electronic products like calculators like tvs like walkman those pent up right so so they throttled off on heavy they loaded up on light right and 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 this transformation i think is embodied by uh, by toyota so let's just think about let's look, go through toyota a little bit toyota was created in the 30s right initially it was a textile uh, uh, machinery manufacturer after the second world war they became the toyota that we sort of know know about they started making cars for the japanese middle class 
because oil was twice as more expensive in Japan than in America, Toyota necessarily made fuel efficient cars. So through the 50s and 60s, as GM, Ford, Chrysler are making these gas guzzlers in America, right? The gas guzzlers that we see in American movies of the 50s and 60s, right? Like mini rockets almost, right? Yeah. Toyota is making these nice dainty cars, fuel efficient cars for that uh, for the Japanese consumer. Then comes bang, the oil price shock of 73. Right? And it's like a gift for Toyota. In 1973, when the oil price shock arrived, Toyota's share of the American motor car market was 2%. 25 years later, their market share was 15%. They went from 2 to 15 in 25 years. They set up giant plants in America through the 80s and 90s. And Toyota basically used its fuel efficient cars. And then obviously through the 80s and 90s, they came up with their famous uh, 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 lean manufacturing, lean manufacturing system, which they, which has become legendary. High quality cars, cost efficient cars, cost efficient both in terms of purchase price and in terms of fuel economy. And you had the makings of a of what is now the world's largest car manufacturer, all because of that adverse event, 1973 oil shock. Right? Casio is even more remarkable. Casio, in a way, is a latter day Apple type story. Right. They came up with the electrical calculator in 1957. An electrical calculator is the size of the bookshelf behind YP. Right? <laughs> electrical calculator is not a chota thing. It's the size of the bookshelf behind YP. This is how people in the 50s and 60s used to use calculators. Then in the 60s, the, 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 the memory chip, was the semiconductor was created. Casio took the memory chip, the semiconductor, put it in the electrical calculator to come up with the electronic calculator. The world's first electronic calculator was also Casio. The world's first electrical calculator Casio, world's first electronic calculator Casio. But even then, the Pahela first electronic calculator was also quite a big thing, right? It was a big beast. It wasn't as big as the shelf behind YP, but it was a book-sized thing. By the early 70s, Casio had mastered the use of semiconductors enough to come up with the, the more compact calculators that we went to, we used in our school days through the 80s and 80s and 90s. And believe it or not, the calculator that Casio created in the early 70s, 50 years on, if you buy a calculator, it pretty much looks like what Casio built in the early 70s. By the late 70s, barring Sharp and Casio, Pretty much everybody else has been driven out of the calculator market. And uh, to, to even today, it's similar, right? It's Texas Instruments is the man in and high end calculator. It's Casio Sharp and Texas Instrument three player market, global domination, billions of dollars of wealth creation. And that this is, you know, I've given you pretty much also the story in a way of Honda, of Nissan, of Panasonic of Sony, the use of ingenuity, of science, of technology, of R&D, uh, rather than saying that oil price, macro, GDP, uh, interest rates are destiny, let's accept our destiny and roll, roll back on our backs and you know, uh, uh, submit ourselves to global forces. Uh, great countries, great economies don't do that. They have, they have hardworking people, they have ing ingenuity, they have intellect, and they use that to propel economic growth. So, big question, uh, Saurav. What makes you say that India can do a Japan today? Absolutely. Now, let's come to India, right? The structure of the Indian economy. So, the, our economy is 50% services. Our economy is not actually a manufacturing heavy economy. So, 1970, in 1970, 50% of the Japanese economy was manufacturing. Today in India, 50% of our economy is services. What the role that manufacturing played for Japan, services will play for India. Right now, let's go deeper into our services. Right, what are our big service industries? The largest is financial services. Right, it's 35% of the stock market. We have a massive financial services ecosystem. Right, banks, insurers, asset managers, brokers, wealth managers, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, this piece is being transformed by India's internal dynamics. And even in the bear market, we can see these internal dynamics in place. I'm sure everybody who's watching this would know that in the last eight months, foreign investors have pulled $30, $35 billion out of India. Local investors, mom and pop, people like you and me, have put $30, $35 billion into the Indian market. If you look at IRITA's website, SEBI's website, RBI's website, and add up the data, in the year ending March 2022, adding mutual fund flows, stock market inflows, life insurance, general insurance, 
If you add it all up, Indian households have invested some $80 billion in financial savings products of various sorts, excluding bank deposits. I'm not getting into bank deposits. Excluding bank deposits, Indian households have invested $80 billion in, 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 in packaged financial products or stocks, right? These are tremendous numbers, right? If you want to look at it at a, as a percentage of GDP, five years ago, household financial services as a percentage of GDP was around 7.5%. Today, in spite of COVID, it stands at 15%. Number of bank accounts have trebled in a decade. The number of brokerage accounts have quadrupled to pentupled in a decade, right? These are tremendous numbers and these just don't happen as a matter of fluke. What this is doing is it's taking India's historical physical wealth, flats, land, gold, and it's financializing it. As physical wealth gets financialized, the cost of capital is dropping structurally, which is why I'm not going to lose too much sleep about the Federal Reserve or the RBI hiking by 100 or 200 basis points. Because the real story, the signal rather than the noise, is the structural drop in the cost of capital in our country. In 2004, the 10-year bond yield in India was, was close to 17%. Today, YP, even after our two sets of rate hikes from the RBI, it's 7%. Right? So as, the, as, the, as we financialize our country, the cost of money drops. It will make for a more efficient economy and more specifically, it is, it is charging up, it is charging up our entire economic ecosystem because, you know, if a, if a high street bank gives home loans at 7%, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that millions of Indian households are buying uh, their first homes. So the year ending March, 2022, the year ending March, 2022 was the biggest year ever in terms of how much residential real estate India sold. My reckoning is the current fiscal, the year ending March 23 will be an even bigger year. Speak to anybody, you know, whoever is watching this, speak to your friends who work in high street banks, who work in real estate. They will tell you they've never seen anything like this ever before in their lives. Not in the 2004, 5, 6 ka boom and neither in the uh, mid 90s ka boom. This is unprecedented. This is the biggest part of our services economy, financial services and in a way the ancillary ecosystem linking back to residential uh, residential homes and the financialization of Indian wealth. By the way, Indian household wealth, uh, uh, if you use Thomas Piketty's criteria of IP, Indian household wealth is around 10 trillion. Thomas Piketty's criteria is household wealth tends to be 3 to 3.5 times GDP, mm -hmm. which means our household wealth is 10 trillion, colossal figure. Mm -hmm. Even if we financialize one tenth of that, a trillion dollars will flow into our country's financial system spaced over spaced over 10 years. That is massive. That's basically the first driver of India's uh, transformation over the next decade. The second piece, a piece that everybody watching this will be very familiar, IT, ITES, the entire KPO, BPO market, right? So let's just put some numbers around this. India's uh, services economy is 50% of our GDP, as I said, uh, uh, within services, the external IT, ITES export oriented part of it is around $250 billion. All right, our services exports are $250 billion, which is roughly 7, 8, 8%, 9% of GDP. Right now, the Western world's, the Western world services economy, Western world, including Japan, Europe, America, their services economy is $15 trillion. Right. Uh, as I was saying at the beginning of our conversation, there is rampant labor shortage in the Western world, right? As I, I gave you the examples of labor shortage in America, I was in London last week. Uh, one in six metro stations, underground stations, they couldn't staff it. They had shut the station. It said so, right? I took photographs. It said so, labor shortage. We can't open this metro station. One in three uh, flights canceled because of labor shortage. Right. And, 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 and you go around the UK, you go around America, you see help wanted signs everywhere. Right. There's a shortage of people to do even basics work like running a metro station, running a uh, running a being a steward on a plane. Right. If you look for people to do HR, payroll, audit, marketing, forget coding, coding to give up. Right. Focus on other aspects of, of office work. They simply don't have the population to do it. Right. So all of those jobs en masse are heading towards India. So anybody who's watching this and you live in Bangalore, you live in Hyderabad, 
you live in pune you live in gurgaon you live in mohali please write and tell us what is the situation there because every time i visit these places these places are exploding they exploding with the amount of jobs that are coming up the amount of apartment blocks that are required for for the workers that mohali or a pune or a hyderabad needs now let's just come back and do the math 15 trillion is the western services economy assume only 10% of that yp gets outsourced to india that means our services exports won't be 250 billion dollars they'll be 1.5 trillion dollars let's assume let's assume this gets done over say 6 7 years leisurely pace me right 250 we like doing things in a leisurely pace right so 250 billion dollars services exports take it to 1. trillion over 6 7 years that easily adds to 2 and a half percentage points of gdp growth for us and we don't need oil last time you tcs or infosys don't use oil as an input uh, when they when they run their businesses they need drains they need graduates and one thing india's economy is great at producing is graduates right so so if you add up bank, banking financial services to it services it yes in the largest sense of the word you got the engines for india's services economy's transformation there right uh, 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 other ancillary industries hotels transportation education you can see the backward linkages if you're going to if you're going to fire up you know infosys this year i think recruited a lakh or people tcs is recruiting 1.5 lakh people i think nascom overall bol raha hai nascom overall is saying 5 lakh or 10 lakh people are required this year for the it services this will fire up the higher education economy right if Uh, if the western world is going to outsource jobs to india in this scale and outsource their economy to india in this scale naturally transportation hotels gets fired up right so the overall services economy goes to a different level compared to what we know it just that for the average person who sort of watches the uh, financial news and re- reads these fatalistic uh, prognostications they don't join these dots and hence my submission to people watching that what happened to america what happened to japan in the 70s which was an efficient economy efficient economy with intelligence with r&d found its place in the world i think the same thing is highly likely to happen to india over the next 10 years as a beleaguered west which doesn't have people doesn't have uh, graduates in enough numbers turns to india and says boss do our work we will pay you for it so let me be the devil's advocate uh, for a minute uh, sort of mm-hmm. where uh, people are pointing to look at uh, it stocks at this point of time how they have fallen over the last few uh, months that is because uh, they anticipate a lack of demand in the west where they have most of their clients so how can we talk about uh, you know all these lacks of uh, so i think lovely point ip this is exactly the point again back to wrong headed prognostication so as you said it stocks have fallen uh the infosys did a analyst i think couple of weeks ago we don't own infosys i'm not so talk, i'm not talking my own book here mm-hmm. infosys did an analyst they saying we haven't heard any client reducing any orders mm-hmm. right because for for western clients now infosys tcs even cognizant right smaller indian companies ltts which is in our portfolio these are now essential for them right so not only infosys uh not tcs no no indian company has talked about any pullback i used to work in accenture for 4 years before i migrated to india uh, uh i spoke to my friends in accenture on my uk trip i was to work work in accenture's london office no shortfall in any sort of demand why why isn't there why isn't a western cto or a western ceo calling up accenture or infosys or tcs in boss mein project cancel kar raha hu right he'll be crazy to do it you don't have anybody to do the work you got a labor shortage rampant labor shortage coursing through your economy pulsing through your economy you need technology to do the work right you need technology to make up for the fact that you don't have ab- 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 abundant to adequate labor in the west world remember both uh, america courtesy the trump era and uk courtesy brexit basically choked off immigration 4 5 years ago so the incoming immigration flow is also not there to do the work mm-hmm. was kaam kon karega if you going to if you going to curtail your it projects with indian it services firms or with accenture who's going to do the work you won't have tech you want people what will you do will shut down the company or what so these sorts of again you know glib forecast that uh, brokerages make and people take them at face value and they sell the stocks right it defies belief it defies uh, natural economic realities uh, that we are seeing in the western world and in india uh, you know roughly roughly in simple english 
the western world needs roughly 5 million indian workers a year right just to correct to do a, a ballpark figure if you look at epfo ka data right because in everybody in india if you, if you get a formal sector job you got to be part of the epfo right epfo's data suggests that in the last 3 years india has created around 30 million formal sector jobs right obviously out of these 30 million i would say half are external facing they're facing out in the western world half are domestic facing even if you take latest month by month epfo data it's suggesting we are creating anywhere between 5 to 10 million jobs a year this sort of formal job creation has never ever been seen before in india it has no link to the interest rate cycle it has zero link to the interest rate cycle and as i said it's a structural story even if the fed were to hike 200 bps which i think is possible the fed could have to hike 200 bps for the next 2 years i doubt this is going to hit the order books of companies that marcelus has invested in such as ltts such as tcs further disclaimer i am also personally invested in marcelus products so are my parents right so therefore we have a vested interest in stocks like tcs and ltts doing well so saurabh uh, what uh, to just, just summarize what you were saying what manufacturing or light manufacturing was to japan in the 70s uh, you expect services to be for india uh, at this point in time uh, there's one caveat there because everybody talks about india also needs to get into manufacturing because it needs to create more jobs so is that something you don't agree with so so look i think it's a global challenge it's it's true that we need to create more jobs but it's unlikely rajesh that we will be able to build a manufacturing economy to employ say the 100 million odd people who are unemployed right so so whilst the formal sector job story is one of unprecedented boom right and people who are watching who read the print watch the show people who are clients of marcelus many of many people in your and my social circle will have a brilliant 10 years ahead of them for people in our country who don't who don't have good education who don't have good skill sets i'm afraid it's not obvious where the jobs are going to come from because the factories are going to get more and more automated you know even if let's assume that we do create a you know semiconductor industry assume the foxconn of the world then create a uh, you know phone foam phone fabrication units none of these industries are particularly labor intensive so the labor intensive style of chinese manufacturing or indeed japanese manufacturing from the 60s and 70s that's long gone uh, and therefore i reckon the the main source of salvation for these poor guys who are you know fighting it out for agni agni veer the agni veers are fighting it out with agni path and all that i think they largely have to live on government doles so that's where the jandhan aadhar mobile construct firing in roughly 60 billion dollars a year directly into people's bank accounts will come very handy uh, i think it's very affordable and i think the world over not just in india whether you're in norway or uh, nigeria or india this will be the way that you'll have to uh, uh, keep people with low skill sets who don't have much by way of educational skills you'll have to keep you'll have to give them a dole uh, and then and they'll have to take the dole and and you'll have to do something to keep them off the streets so they don't go on burning down trains and buses and so on i don't think any country in the world has found a palliative for mass scale job creation i don't think india has one either that's uh, unfortunate to uh, hear sorab but so what's the moral of the story at the end of this comparison for us uh, with japan and the us and when it comes to innovation the moral of the story is what drives growth is not interest rate set by the fed what drives growth is a country's comparative advantage our competitive advantage lies in uh, high skilled uh, high skilled uh, graduates are doing work uh, not just in it services not just in coding that's i think well understood but also beyond that in a gamut of office related services such as hr audit finance payroll marketing sales the western world doesn't have enough of these people and we are seeing in large numbers western companies give contracts to accenture to tcs to uh, infosys saying take my entire company pretty much i will keep a boardroom in london and new york and some front office people everything else i will send to india this this is a colossal opportunity i would say it's potentially it's multi trillion dollars but if you ask me to put a ballpark on it i think 1.5 trillion dollars of extra services exports that we'll have over the next 5 6 years enough to comfortably fire up growth alongside that a healthy financial system 
capital adequacy ratio of Indian bank stands at 17%, highest ever. Households financializing wealth at a rapid rate, cost of capital falling, falling, cost of capital falling. Healthy financial system, healthy services exports, right? Uh, uh, enough to give us a formidable economic engine over the next 10 years. It's not perfect. I completely agree with you. In a uh, 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 blue collar job creation, zilch, unlikely to happen. Social issues around that, highly likely. But the engines that are firing are formidable engines. They're going to create wealth. Let's watch out for those rather than you know ad nauseum repeating. Fed will hike rates. India will get into trouble because econ economics doesn't work quite as simply as that. It may not be a perfect situation for India, but it's still a colossal opportunity. The moral of the story, as Saurabh says, is that the world belongs to countries and companies who can deal with exogenous shocks with enterprise, innovation, and hard work just like Japan did in the 1970s. Can India do that now in the 21st century is what we all look forward to. And Saurabh is very confident India can do that. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Quartermaster. I'm sure you'll take home a lot of good lessons from Saurabh's wisdom. And we will be back with another episode next quarter. Until then, watch the print and stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.